Good morning, God bless you, and welcome to Bethel Assembly of God's virtual service. Regrettably, we are having to observe shelter in, orders, uh, shelter in place orders again, so we are not having a live service. However, we are providing the word of God so that we can continue to worship together as a spiritual community, even where we are. So, even though I regret that we can't be together again, I trust that this latest time to shelter in place will be brief. Even though we can't be together in person, I am eternally grateful for the technology that allows us to do this so that we can still have the Word of God by way of video. With that in mind, I'd like to express my gratitude to the AV team. They work behind the scenes each week and they make this possible. So my sincerest gratitude goes out to our AV team. Thank you for all your hard work and faithful service each week behind the scenes. As we prepare for Thanksgiving in this most unusual and difficult year, I hope this message will help to put some perspective on why we should be grateful even now. If you are in good health and you can view this message, then you have reason to rejoice right there. However, allow me to get into this further. Today I'm going to ask you to join me in Acts chapter 16. We will begin reading in verse 16, which will give us some context into these events that take place. The word of God reads, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us Romans to observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Today, I'd like to talk to you about true freedom. We're going to discuss keys that will unlock your personal prison. Let's pray for the ministry of the word. My gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look into the scriptures and we pray that you would speak to us today through the word of God. May the anointing rest upon this word so that those who feel like they are bound by their circumstances would find release. For those who feel like they are in a prison place, that they would find true freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In his enormously successful book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey shares this inspiring story of Viktor Frankl. He writes, Frankl was a determinist raised in the tradition of Freudian psychology, which postulates that whatever happens to you as a child shapes your character and personality and basically governs your whole life. The limits and parameters of your life are set and basically, there's not much you can do about it. Frankel was also a psychiatrist and a Jew. He was imprisoned in the Nazi death camps where he experienced things that were so 
repugnant to our sense of decency that we shudder even to think of them. His parents, his brother, and his wife died in the camps or were sent to the gas ovens. Except for his sister, his entire family perished. Frankel himself suffered torture and innumerable indignities, never knowing from one moment to the next if he would, his path would eventually lead to the ovens or if he would be among the saved who would remove the body or shovel out the ashes of those who had perished. One day, naked and alone in a small room, he began to become aware of what he later called the last of the human freedoms. The freedom his Nazi captors could not take away. They could, not, they could control his entire environment. They could do what they wanted to his body. But Viktor Frankl himself was a self-aware being who could look as an observer at his very involvement. His basic identity was intact. He could decide within himself how all of this was going to affect him. Between what happened to him or the stimulus and the response to it was his freedom or power to choose that response. In the midst of his experiences, Frankel would project himself into different circumstances, such as lecturing to his students after his release from the death camps. He would describe himself in the classroom, in his mind's eye, and give his students the lessons he was learning during his very torture. Those series of such disciplines, mental, emotional, and moral, principally using memory and imagination, he exercised his small embryonic freedom until it grew larger and larger, until he had more freedom than his Nazi captors. They had more liberty, more options to choose in their environment, but he had more freedom, more internal power to exercise his options. He became an inspiration to those around him, even to some of the guards. He helped others find meaning in their suffering and dignity in their prison experience. You might say that Paul and Silas demonstrated that, that same exact freedom that Frankel was writing about. Let's take a look at the circumstances leading up to their imprisonment. A girl with a spirit of divination followed Paul and his companions, proclaiming, most likely in a very unseemly way, that they were servants of the Most High God. He taught people the way to be saved. When this persisted for a number of days, Paul was stirred to take action, and he cast the spirit out of that girl. What should have been applauded because he released the young girl from the enemy's bondage was met with sharp opposition. Now that the girl was delivered, she could no longer tell fortunes and make money for her masters who profited from this girl's ministry. This reminds us that tragically, our message will not always be welcomed, even if it does help someone. Those who benefit from the exploitation of others are true enemies of the gospel. Not only do they oppose the message, but they attempt to barricade the path that leads to freedom from those bound by the enemy for their own gain. However, even worse than that, Paul and Silas find themselves victory, victims of a gross injustice. They didn't do anything wrong. Yet, they were thrown in prison on phony charges, all because the owners of this, sa this slave girl lost their way to make easy money off of her bondage. Paul and Silas could have been angry, bitter, or even discouraged over their unfair treatment. However, they found the keys to freedom right there 
in their prison cell. You see, Paul and Silas were free long before the prison doors swung open. I'll make this as simple as I can. Experiencing true freedom begins with having a faith perspective and an overcomer's attitude. Allow me to say that again. Experiencing true freedom begins with having a faith perspective and an overcomer's attitude. How could perspective make such a big difference in my circumstances? How you view your circumstances will determine how you respond to them and the attitude that you will have. If your perspective is infused with faith, then you will have the keys that will secure your own release. The jailbreak begins with you. You are the personal warden, and you hold the keys to your own release. Circumstances may hold you captive, but you can still experience freedom. Notice what the Word of God says about the power of faith. Jesus tells his disciples, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he asks. If faith can move mountains, then it can open prison doors. How? Well, when you have a faith perspective, then it will equip you with the keys for your own release. So I'd like to talk to you about the four keys that will open your personal prison. Let's take a look at how Paul and Silas found their, free, how, found their freedom. The first key to their prison door was that their first inclination was to pray. Let's go back to the scripture text in Acts and pick up where we left off. Verse 25 says, but at the midnight, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. Allow me to pause right there. Allow me to say that prayer should be your first cause of action, not your last resort. Sometimes we talk about prayer so casually, but it can accomplish miracles. So why do we sometimes, why don't we sometimes experience those answers to prayers? Maybe it's because we just don't take prayer seriously enough. Samuel Rodriguez shares a powerful personal testimony about the kind of breakthrough we can receive in prayer. He states that the two greatest powers that we as believers have are the power to cry out and the power to agree. Earlier this year, Rodriguez tested positive for COVID-19, but he was one of those asymptomatic individuals who was barely affected by the disease. However, his 29-year-old daughter also became sick with the disease and ended up in the intensive care unit, fighting for her life. Naturally, he struggled with this. For one thing, it just didn't make any sense to him. After all, she was young and healthy. Here he was, he's older, and yet he was asymptomatic. It didn't affect him, and yet she, a young, healthy girl, was fighting for her life in the ICU. And also, this was his daughter. I mean, regardless of the reason, this is his daughter in the intensive care unit fighting for her life. That's every parent's worst nightmare. And even more difficult, as many of you know, he wasn't even allowed to speak with her. So he sat outside the hospital in his car, and he said he just lost it. He broke right there in the car. He cried out to God right there. And as he lifted his cry to God, he felt the presence of God right there with him in the car. He said, some of our most powerful encounters with heaven are not when we're perfect, but when we're broken. Notice what the word says. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. 
He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. And he put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. There is incredible power in lifting your urgent cry to God. However, if you remember, he also mentioned a second point. It's when you come into agreement. He said that he felt a witness from God there in the parking lot, and he prayed in agreement with the witness that he felt from the Lord. He prayed accordingly. So he said, God, I come into agreement that your angels will fill her room. And that's how he prayed. He felt impressed by God to pray that way. I come into agreement that your angels will fill her room. And then he asks God, Lord, can you just give me some kind of indication that you heard me? Just give me some kind of confirmation. Shortly after, he receives a text from his daughter in ICU. The text read, Dad, it's not the meds, but I just felt that the angels filled my room. I mean, where in the world would she get that? In 24 hours, her condition totally turned around and she was released out of the ICU. And then in another 24 hours, she was completely released. She experienced a complete reversal because he came into agreement with heaven. Notice what Jesus said. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done by my Father who is in heaven." So right there in prison, Paul and Silas cried out, and they came into agreement, and that was the beginning of a divine earthquake that would eventually lead to their release and so much more. Let's look at the next key to their prison door. In spite of their difficulty and the unfair circumstances, they chose to praise Let's look again at verse 25. It reads, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Imagine that. Here they are. I mean, it, think of how uncomfortable it must have been. Thrown into the inner prison, bound in the stocks, wounded, bleeding from the beating. There they were praising God. Though Paul and Silas were innocent men who were unjustly treated and cruelly beaten, they still found it in themselves to give God glory and praise. Even when times are bad, God is still good. They were able to find the joy in their circumstances rather than feel sorry for themselves. They were free on the inside even before God set them free on the outside. This passage serves as a reminder of the liberating power of praise. Whether locked in a very real prison or as this situation revealed or perhaps other circumstances that confine God's people, praise puts the focus on God's great power, not our own difficulties. True freedom exists in knowing, recognizing, and believing in God's unlimited power. Allow me to say that your release from the power of praise, that your release, that you release the power of praise when you choose to praise even in the midst of your difficult circumstances. Most people say, I'll praise God when he turns things around. If you think that, then you have it backwards. It's when you praise God, even in the midst of difficult and distressing circumstances, that God will bring the turnaround. Look at what the word says. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no 
herds in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on my high hills. It's when you praise God, regardless of the difficulties and distress, that he lifts you up above your problems and he gives you victory. That leads to the next key in, uh, to release you from your personal prison. Paul and Silas also became free because they tapped into God's power. Notice what the word of God says. Acts 16, verse 26. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Prayer and praise led to a tangible, visible, undeniable manifestation of the power of God. I remind you of what I shared two weeks ago from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. The word of God reads, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That's exactly what Paul and Silas experienced in the prison place. They may have just thought that God was lifting their spirits, but he did exceedingly abundantly above all they asked by opening wide their prison doors and breaking their chains. Now, as incredible as that was, Paul and Silas had an appropriate faith perspective because they saw this as more than just a moment of deliverance. They saw the possibilities. Let's continue reading in Acts, beginning at verse 27. The word of God reads, And the keeper of the prison, awake from, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, suppose, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, he ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes. And immediately he and all the family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Notice, this was about much more than just a release from prison for two innocent men. This was about an opportunity for God to be glorified in many lives. Notice that verse 25 said that when Paul and Silas were praying and praising God, the prisoners were listening to them. They saw the power of God demonstrated through them. And through them, the power of God opened prison doors and broke chains. That became a powerful testimony to them. If nothing else, this series of events led to the salvation of the Philippian prison keeper and his entire family. Paul and Silas used this opportunity to tell him and his household about Christ. Then they baptized them immediately. God was able to use this difficult and unfair circumstance for his glory. In the book Living Forward, Michael Hyatt shares an, imp an, an important lesson he learned about recognizing possibilities. He writes... I, um, in 2003, I was named president of Thomas Nelson Publishers, the seventh largest book publisher in the United States. It was an extremely busy time with a lot of pressure to perform. One morning, on my way to work, I grabbed my computer in my right hand and a fresh cup of coffee in my left and headed downstairs to leave for work. Four steps from the bottom, I slipped on the carpet without a free hand to grab the stair rail. I tumbled flat on my rear on the landing, and as I landed, I splashed coffee all, over, all the way down. But the mess was only the beginning. I was already running late for a busy day. 
I stood to take care of things and to get going, and that's when the pain hit. My ankle was broken. My day was scuttled. So were the next 10 days. I had to have surgery, including a plate and six screws, to repair the damage. And on top of that, I had to wear a therapeutic boot for three months. That looked far from presidential. This couldn't have happened at a worse time. At that point, I could have asked myself several questions. Why am I so clumsy? Why does this have to happen now? Why does this have to happen to me? Why do, what did I do to deserve this? But the problem with these questions is that they are completely, un, they are completely unproductive and disempowering. They are natural, of course, probably even necessary. It's all part of the process of grieving a loss. But ultimately, there are better questions to ask. One of the best questions you can ask when something bad, something negative happens is this. What does this make, what does this experience make possible? Do you see the shift? Suddenly, your attention moves from the past, which you can't do anything about, to the future. And in my case, a broken ankle had several positive benefits including some much needed rest. Regardless of the circumstances, the bottom line is this, you can't always choose what happens to you. Accidents and tragedies happen. What you can do is choose how you respond to the situation. One of the best ways to begin is to ask yourself the right questions. So, you may lament your circumstances and view them as unfair. But maybe God allowed them as a way of using it as a gateway to blessing, not only for you, but for many. Then they can be, they can, they can be exactly that if you see the bigger possibilities that they offer. With that in mind, I know this has been a really difficult year. And as we're beginning yet another lockdown, you may be feeling pretty beaten up. But allow me to offer a faith perspective on your struggles right now. You see, your scars are what make you a star. In verse 24, it says that Paul and Silas were beaten with many stripes. In verse 33, it says that the jailer washed their stripes. In other words, he was washing their wounds to soothe them. Well, those wounds would eventually become scars. Not only that, Paul was beaten and suffered for the faith on many other occasions. This led him to write, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Allow me to give you a little better insight on what this means. In his latest book, From Survive to Thrive, Pastor Samuel Rodriguez shares this amazing account, and it's something that would not naturally occur to you. Notice what he says. I learned another amazing fact about lions in the wild while visiting the nature preserve in South Africa. A lion with scars has access to new territory. While it's easy to think of Scar, you know, in the Disney movie, Simba's vicious, villainous uncle uh, the, from The Lion King, most African lions do usually end up scarred from their various, various territorial battles over the years, whether fighting with other lions over the boundary skirmishes or defending themselves from the natural enemies such as hyenas and cheetahs. Lions accumulate scars that tell a story about their battle history. Even more striking, though, is the way these battle scars work in the lion's favor when he ventures into new areas. Apparently, the more scars a lion has accrued, the more the other animals will perceive him as a fighter, as a leader, as a survivor. Consequently, they usually stay out of his way, and they let him have new territory. Whether our battle scars are invisible or are apparent to all those around us every day, they tell a story of our lives. 
just like a lion's, we can also use them to our advantage. Not to intimidate others with our bad reputation, but to demonstrate how God is at work in our lives. Why are we so inspired, so moved, so jubilant when we see a Paralympian transcending her physical limp limitations to win a gold medal? Why do we want the, don, the downtrodden underdog to win his battle with racial injustice and triumph over those who demean him? Why is David's victory over Goliath so powerful even now, more than 2,000 years later? Because people who overcome impress us. Their tenacity, determination, hard work, and most of all, their faith shows us that we can keep going until we win our current battle. We can endure our present suffering and trust that God will use it for good in, this, in his divine wisdom and sovereignty. People with scars have been through some painful situations and endured some devastating losses, but they have not given up. They know that God has called them to get back on their feet so they can step out in faith and keep going. They, they know that there are giants to slay and new territories to be slain. They know that God has something glorious in the works just ahead. And it's the best is yet to come. They know that they have taken God's promise to heart, take possession of the land and settle in it because I have given it to you to occupy. The scars that you bear are what give you credibility, and they give you authority. You are an overcomer, and you have the marks to prove it. Don't think of them as ugly disfigurations. Do like Paul and wear them as a symbol of victory and spiritual authority. So allow me to remind you, prayer, praise, power, possibilities. These are your four keys to open your personal prison. Join me in taking a moment to pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and I pray that the precious Holy Spirit would speak to us in our circumstances. And who knows, but we may find ourselves in a very deep pit, in a difficult prison place. But Lord, I pray that you, O oh God, would release your people. Give them the faith so that they will have a perspective that they see, O oh God, themselves not as victims, not as defeated people, but they would see themselves on the verge of marvelous possibilities as they, oh God, look to you. Father, I pray, equip us with the keys so that we too may be released from our personal prison and so that we too, oh God, can be used to see, to, used to do marvelous things, things we never thought possible. And Lord, to you be all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. And even in spite of our circumstances, allow me to wish you and your family a happy and healthy Thanksgiving. I know that we've been through a very difficult year, but we still have much for which to be grateful. God bless you all. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you.